All right. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Uh, what is the date today? Um, March 13th? Yes. Ooh, 13th. Sunday the 13th. Why isn't that a problem? Why is it, it Friday is the 13th? We, we lost an hour last night. We did. Uh, a we, real problem. We've entered daylight savings time. The clock moved forwards, which actually messed me up a little bit today because I was going to be doing uh, this presupposition panel. There, there's yeah. so it was me and Ozzy and Dan Linford and uh, Alex and said that we're stationed all over the world. So they decided to be really smart if we just scheduled it based on GMT and then folks could figure out what their time zone was. <laughs> yeah. So I set an alarm on a device that is automatically up updated with daylight savings and got up and uh, the daylight saving stuff didn't change for the organizer over in the UK so I was early. Oh, well at uh, least you weren't like an hour behind. Yeah, I, I despise being always. late. Yeah. If I tell you I'm going to be somewhere I really want to be there. So this is, the, time for anything, so. this is the Atheist Experience TV show, podcast, I don't know, debacle, whatever you want to say it is, live out of Austin, Texas. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Martin Wagner woo, of, uh, of Wagner Film. Ah. Oh. And uh, we're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. We're actually hosting this from the Atheist Community of Austin's Free Thought Library. And there's uh, a sheet of glass about, what, 12, 13 feet away? Yeah, and on the other side of it are like a whole bunch of people uh, who are looking at us like we're in a fishbowl. There's our, yes, which, which our is amazing always studio audience whom you can't hear, so we can't, like, uh, you know, we don't have the, the John Stewart feedback of just loud cheers. And yeah, like, I mean, you guys have to of, cheer really loud for them yeah. to hear you. Although these mics are sensitive. You, so. I think I was picking up the air conditioner a minute ago on the mic. <laughs> um, the telephone number is at the bottom of the screen right below Martin right there, 512-686-0279. And you can also go to atheist-experience.com, and there'll be a call the show link if you want to call from your uh, device or computer of some sort. But we have all six phone lines full um, with at least... We can do that here now. I mean, the, the new phone box has been fantastic. So. Yeah, even at the public access studio, we had four at best. Yeah. Usually three. Yeah, usually just that, that fourth one never was never used. You can't hear who? You can't hear me? Well, is my, Martin's mic off? Well... Nope, it's on. Yeah, I'm on, so. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, taking some calls, and we may uh, may have to interrupt things to, to yeah, work on a microphone. <laughs> but anyway, this is a live call-in show, and we uh, have people call in. Essentially, we want to know what you believe and why, where we might disagree. We'll answer questions about, you know, atheism, the atheist community, uh, religion, philosophy, who knows, maybe some science or whatever else. But uh, a lot of it has to do with having conversations because there are people out there who, for whatever reason, whether it's come from the pulpit, it's come from their experience with certain people, uh, they're baffled that there are non-believers. And let me tell you, with church attendance on the decline and the nuns, the N-O-N-E folks, the people who subscribe to no religion, on the rise, um, you're only going to be hearing a lot more about this. And, you know, if we're wrong, if I'm wrong, and in fact there is a God and there's some good reason to believe this, I would definitely want to know it. The problem is I've been hosting the show now for almost 12 years. You think you could have called by now? Yeah. Um, I don't know why God didn't call mm -hmm. uh, or any of his representatives, um, but the people who are claiming to be his representatives. A personal assistant or an agent? or a Yeah, it's just uh, haven't really given a good argument. It's, it, it's one of those things where I was a fundamentalist believer for more than 25 years, and the God I believed in was real and obvious, and I thought I had good arguments for it. And when I found out that the arguments that I had were actually fallacious, that I didn't have good supporting evidence, I changed my mind, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is kind of the thing that, that I would say should people should do. Ought to do. That's yeah. usually how rational thought goes. Yeah, I, I, yeah. and it, it, by the way, changing your mind mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're a flip-flopper. doesn't mean you're just willy-nilly going with whatever happens to be popular. It, there are reasons Unless why people change their mind. that's the kind of mind-changing that you do. Yeah. But, um, I think most people, but if you change your mind based on You've sincerely sought out some answers yeah. and have come to come to terms with the fact that you were wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. So on that note, we do at least have one theist waiting to call. That's Dave from Sturgeon Bay. Thanks for waiting. Well, thanks much, Matt. Appreciate it. How you doing? Good, good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Are you, are you guys having good weather? Because we had rain for like four or five days, and now it's finally beautiful. It's turning the corner. It's getting better. Uh, Green Bay is uh, always about 10, 10 degrees warmer, so that's not saying a lot because that's still cold up there. So. All right. So yeah. you had a question yeah. for us about uh, kind of bridging the divide between uh, something related to truth. So go ahead. 
it, it, you know, it wasn't really necessarily bridging the divide. It was just, you know, I've watched the show for about a, a year and a half or so. And I, and I was, you know, I was raised Catholic and then I became an agnostic. And, um, and then uh, through a series of events, you know, I, I became, a, I became a, a Christian and am still. And, um, you know, I, and I, I believe the same things that, that I think anybody at least was an agnostic probably the same as, as an atheist at the time, which, you know, that uh, I, I just, you know, believed in evolution and believed in all the things that you know, I think that in, you normally would, logically. But over time, as I, I, as I began questioning, um, I came to, I'm not going to go into my background, but my, I guess I get to my bottom line question is that it doesn't seem as I've listened to and tried to understand the method of logic and how, and all the conversations that I've heard over the past year plus is that I, I've come to, come to a, a, a brick wall where it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it's possible. It's just in, an impossible conversation because there's no way of proving you know, on a, like scientifically almost. I mean, there's just no way of proving that God exists other than the anecdotal of sure. my experience and the anecdotal of other people's experiences. And I mean, they're not whacked out people. There they're, they're are individuals that, and, I, and I've met people from all over the world, and particularly the people from the Middle East. So, and Dave? Even more. Yeah, go ahead. So, if there's something that we can't demonstrate, yeah. Should, should anybody believe it? Well, it's demonstrated. That's just it. it became, am, am I using the right word by anecdotal? Uh, people's experiences, the things that that they've related to me, is that is that the correct term? Um, because that's that's what that's what seems to be tangible. The only tangible thing is that I I have over the past now it's been forty years, and and the people that I've met over those over those decades are very credible people, well-balanced, mature. Sure, but uh, the, does that tell you anything at all? So I've met plenty of people yeah. who I consider to be truthful, and they tell me yeah. stories, and I don't think they're lying, but no, what, I don't, no. what I don't think is that there's any good reason to believe they're, what they're portraying is real. For example, I've heard people tell me they encountered a ghost. I believe that they mm. had an experience that they mm. are relaying as I had an encounter with a ghost, but that doesn't mm. mean we have good evidence to believe that they actually had an encounter with a ghost, because people can be wrong and people can, right. you know, have right. uh, dreams and false memories and all sorts. Of, right. You know, we don't have enough information to say that the most reasonable conclusion is that they're right. So, given that, right. uh, you know, you're, you're right in pointing out that there's a lot of anecdotal claims, but there's a lot of anecdotal claims for a lot of different religions. And so even if you were, you were desperately trying to, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that there's something to all of this, what can you determine about what that actual something is? It, you know, there's a number of different possibilities. Either these are mistakes in the way humans think and process information, or there's something potentially real and supernatural about it. But if we apply that method honestly and fairly across the entirety of human claims about experiences, then we would be in a position where we would be simultaneously forced to accept mutually exclusive claims. We would have to believe in the Jesus claims, in the Allah claims, in, you know, Scientology and Hinduism. Uh, and that demonstrates that the method that we're using to assess these claims is fundamentally flawed because it doesn't lead us to identify which of a number of competing hypotheses is most likely to be correct. Well, it, it seems that you know, in thirty years' experience so far, you know, and, and at some point, you know, it's kind of like the old you know, learning basic logic in back in college. You know, the, the, all the beans in the barrel are white, but maybe there's a black bean, and you you keep pulling. So it's inductive, and 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 I and I and I look at all of the conversations I've had over over these years. And like I say, they are they are very credible, well balanced people, and, and I think the consistency I see, I've seen is that their lives were inexplicably radically changed. What, why? So why? Oh, I mean, from a very bad situation to why is it inexplicably? inexplicable? That that doesn't people people change 
irrespective mm -hmm. of religious views all the time. To say mm -hmm. that it's inexplicable, and first of all, would be an acknowledgement that you therefore can have no explanation uh, that you should then accept. But even sticking with your one black bean in a jar thing, uh, yeah, there's there's a bit of inference that takes place. You keep pulling and, and you never get a black mm -hmm. bean. You could possibly mm -hmm. infer that there's not one, but at a minimum, mm -hmm. you can't be justified in believing there is one and so that when you look at, you talked about, you know, the bulk of experience. Well, the bulk of experience is of all the times people have claimed that a god or anything supernatural was real, not once has anybody been able to verify this for any of the supernatural claims. And, I don't know, and that's why I say it's impossible. It's an impossible conversation, it seems, because how do you ever prove that, that all the people that I've met, and a good number of them, are telling the truth? Proof. That, 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 that's a shifting of the burden of proof. proof. That's it's a shifting. Possible, Dave. And it's also. Yeah. It's. I was going to say. It's also. You know. A, a bit of a fallacy. Simply to to say, because a thing has had a positive impact, on on the lives of its believers, therefore it is likely to be true. Has no bearing, really. It's a, on, on why, the truth well, or why, the falsity of it. It simply that? means that well, when you consider all of the factors involved in religion, particularly when you've got something like Christianity, which has this full support of the society uh, you know our system yeah. for example here uh, it, it's the the degree of social reinforcement the fact that churches as entities build communities among people and these are things that are designed to be like social hubs that are meant to make you feel like you belong somewhere if you were previously somebody who never had that sense in your life uh, they provide these outlets there are any number of reasons why religion can make pe give people happy feelings and make them feel, uh, you know, positive where, you know, before they were unhappy. But that still doesn't yeah. really have any, any, any bearing on its claims about supernatural realms and deities and what have you. It's an entirely separate question. So I, I think that yeah. when, you, when, you, when you say that it's, a, it's an impossible discussion, I, I, it sounds to me like what you're doing is that you're, on the one hand, we, you've got the discussion about can religion be a positive force in people's lives? And then on the other hand, you've got the discussion, you know, do actual gods exist? I think those are, are they're related questions, but at the same time, each one sort of has its own set of answers that don't really have any bearing on the other. And so um, it's possible that, well, I, I tend to believe uh, you know, George H. Smith, who was a you know, prominent atheist writer some years ago, he said, you know, scratch the surface of a Christian and you'll find an agnostic. I think that what a... a a whole lot of folks get out of the religious experience is just the experience of it. Uh, that sense of community, belonging, um, you know, maybe just some sort of vague feeling that, well, I'm not all alone in the universe and therefore I don't have to have all these existential fears all the time. But when you, when you really try to get down to the, to the nitty gritty of, is this stuff actually true, the same way that you would pursue a scientific claim, you'll find even a lot of practicing Christians just don't think about that end of it, or do you know, don't even really see a need to think, they're like, yeah, well, you know, it's down to faith, and et cetera, et cetera. Because when you, that's really not the important thing, I think, to a lot of believers. If you, if you take a look at the full argument of, of what you're making, if we, were, if we were kind of to distill your argument, it comes down to, you know, I've been observing for 40 years all kinds of people talking about their belief in God, and I've seen people's lives changed, and it just doesn't seem likely to me that they could all be wrong. I mean, that seems to be yeah, the, the crux of your argument. Well, and it's, and I'm not, you know, and I, I, I appreciate the phrasing in the form of my argument. I'm not, I don't know that at this point I'm trying to pose an argument. Maybe all, we're all, no matter what we say, we're posing arguments, but arguments in the sense of being negative here. Um, but I understand just the logic, trying to logically come to a conclusion here. And, yeah. And the, the, the experiences, and, I, and I'm right now just isolating the conversation to just the, the conversations and, and people that I've met over 40 years, is that there are specific people that, that it is so radical. and they're, they're, Are you saying that they, we don't see radical changes in people who aren't believers in that particular religion? Well, no, it could be, you can, and yes, you can have other religions where people have radical changes. How about no religion? I'm just narrowing it down, I'm, I'm, and it could be no religion. But okay, they're, so, they're so basically we have a situation where we're acknowledging we can see radical changes in people's lives, people who have no religion, and people who have varied religions. So mm -hmm. what is the common mm -hmm. factor among all of those things? 
What is the common factor amongst all those things? People. Okay. Okay. But it, but the fact that I may have ten different categories of people of, of various beliefs, all saying they have the certain experiences that all have positive experiences on their life, I, that doesn't mean that. Uh, let's if say you took 10, all the people who won the lottery and divided yeah. them up into blocks, and some of them credited their lucky rabbit's foot, and others credited Jesus, and some just mm -hmm. said that, you know, mm -hmm. hey, I got incredibly lucky, and you look at all of these different things, the common thing here is that there are people who are making claims mm -hmm. about a cause that can't demonstrate it, and yet we have that same effect with other claimed causes. Okay. So okay. if, is if the possible? thing is, if the, if the goal is that we can't determine which of them is correct, then the only rational position is not to believe any of those claims until you can. And when you, when you okay. earlier, what you tried to do was kind of shift the burden of proof by saying, well, you can't prove these people are wrong. Well, you're right. I can't also prove that the, that the lottery winner who won and claims that it was because of their rabbit's foot, mm -hmm. I can't prove that they're wrong either. That's a shifting of the burden of proof. Okay. Is it possible that, and that, let's keep the universe of, people here in types to, to tens for example is it possible that all of them can be wrong sure okay is it possible that nine of them can be wrong and one of them can be right well it depends see one of the things is when you ask is it possible for there a god to for a god to exist there's been no demonstrated demonstration that it's possible so the only context in which we could say it's possible is that it hasn't been ruled out which i don't find particularly compelling Okay, but but, the, but even if I accepted that, ahead. is it possible that one of them was correct? I'll go ahead and, yeah. and say, yes, it's possible, even though I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And we are still no closer to determining which of them is actually correct. Okay. They're making, they're making well, mutually exclusive okay. claims. They're believing in different gods. Right. They're claiming different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. We know they can't all be right. And there doesn't seem to be any reason that they couldn't all be wrong. And nobody's demonstrated that they are right, or even that they're possibly right. And again, even if all you're using as your barometer is so and so had um, massive uh, improvements in their, mm -hmm. their you know, mm -hmm. condition of living, in their state of right. happiness, if you have those ten different people, one of them can attribute uh, or chooses to attribute, uh, you know, their their newfound happiness to to God or their belief in God or what have you. Right. That's still one of those ten people, and so you have now two situations. You've got the fact that uh, that a belief has positive impact on someone's life still does not say anything to whether or not it is actually true. And secondly, based on the example we're using right now, if Christianity is a thing that brings positive change to people's lives, it is but one of many things that has that effect. So mm -hmm. if, you know, if all you're looking for is... For, to validate it is, but look at all the people who have had positive changes in their lives. Well, if you're willing to admit that the that positive change can come about by any number of re means, then now we now you have yeah. Christianity is still not necessarily true, and it's not the only path to happiness. So, yeah, no, I understand. There I understand. You go. And, and I'm I, and again, I'm isolated just to this idea of of the uh, experiences of people. And, and I have to say my own personal experience, but this is not about telling you about my own personal experience. I'm just trying to. So just take the, the, that particular approach of. Oh, I get it. You know, I mean, this is this having, is not having had experience. This is not anything new or foreign by any stretch of the imagination. It's something that I think all of us fall prey to from time to time. Because one thing is, if somebody comes to you with a story, you want yeah. to believe them. Generally speaking, no, I, we don't make <laughs> the assumption that people are lying to us. We wait. We kind of we kind of grant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the yeah. thing is. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If somebody comes to me and says, you know, well, my niece just sent me pictures today of the new puppy that they went and picked up. I believe that my niece has a new puppy. I haven't seen it in person, but, you know, I've got the pictures and I trust her. Um, yeah. If she had sent me pictures of their invisible pink unicorn or the dragon in their garage to go back right. to Sagan, I'm not going to believe that just based on the fact that my niece is generally trustworthy and she sent me a picture. 
I'm probably going to suspect yeah. that she's playing a joke on me to test me because the claim itself is so far outside of what we understand about reality. And what could be yeah. further outside of what we understand about reality than some sort of thinking agent that exists outside of space and time that people are referencing as the cause for actions when there's no mechanism ever demonstrated that these things could be real? Yeah. Well, like I say, you know, uh, I can only go off of my own personal experience personal experience and again this, uh, yep. i'd love to be able to call back again some other time sure. to take to really look at it from a, a, a different approach or a different point of view but just right now sticking because i know you guys got other calls i don't want to take a lot of time but absolutely just, just staying with staying with um people's experiences i mean i'll, I'll just maybe just cite one um it's just a, a the church that, that i've attended for a number of years uh the pastor was was uh, a medical doctor and he, he established a first medical hospital in Somalia back before people were talking about Somalia back in the 60s. And he used to, um, so he had a lot of relationships with people in, in back in the old Soviet Union and, and communist China and the Middle East. And the Middle Easterners are just, uh, just amazing. There's one particular gentleman who um, was a devout, uh, radical um, uh, Shiite Muslim and, and, uh, the you know jihadist and and uh, dedicated to Allah and and uh, you know participated in the executions and was arrested um, uh, in in the Middle East uh, in a particular uh, journey and um, imprisoned and his story I mean um, the bottom line is that that he says that Jesus personally appeared to him. And and I won't even go through all the details. It was it was, it was quite an amazing story. But but for it, this did man, Jesus tell him anything man, important for the rest of us? Like, did Jesus told, give him the cure to some disease or inform us about something that we weren't aware of? Because if not, this man, Jesus is kind of yeah, a dick. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and why why yeah. is he picking out one person over here to personally appear to and give this message? And the rest of us, who were once believers or not, right. can seek right. forever and get nothing. And we have, you know, loved ones being inflicted with diseases that evidently Jesus could, you know, could heal. You listen to the reports, and he's, he's right. uh, you know, laying hands on and healing the blind and, and mm -hmm. the lepers and everybody else. Why the hell did that stop? Why is it that well, miracles because, seem to yeah. decay yeah. at directly uh, in opposition to our ability to investigate them? Yeah. I mean, the big joke is that as soon as we got video cameras, miracles pretty much right. stopped. And, and in that case, I would also sort of consider the source. I mean, based on your description, here you have a guy whose, uh, I guess, life up to that point had been, he was a guy who had bad belief systems and made bad decisions and engaged in bad behaviors based on that belief system. And suddenly he shifts from this one to the other, and I'm, 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 I'm expected to believe that, oh, well, now he's, he's taken a rational path? You know, now he says that you know, Jesus came and actually spoke to him. Would have been nice for Jesus to have dropped by and, and have that little, you know, tete -tete, you know, before he went out doing all of his, uh, you know, jihadi things that got him arrested in the first place. The number of people who think Jesus spoke to them is kind of staggering. As yeah. soon as Jesus comes and tells me that he actually spoke to them, then I'll have yeah. some reason to believe it. Yeah, I mean, I would have been much more impressed if Jesus had appeared to this guy before he, I don't know, shot or blew up whatever it was he shot or blew up and said, uh, yeah. let me, let's talk about this shooting and blowing up things. Why, why doesn't Jesus show yeah. up at a Trump rally and explain whether or not Trump is correct or the Pope is correct yeah. about who's the true Christian? Yeah, see, so, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so you're getting back to, yes, yeah, so someone had a perceived positive change in their life and therefore, no, again, no right. no bearing on the truth value of the claim. Yeah, this, this gets back to what I said earlier. Yeah. I believe they have some experience and they're trying to make sense of it. I just don't ex accept right. their explanation. May I, may I, you know, because you've mentioned a number of things about the gentleman, I may I, you know, fill in a little bit more of the blanks on this because you asked the question, Matt, about, you know, what effect did it have on him. So can I, can I elaborate a little bit more and just tell you the story? Well, I don't know that it makes any difference. Yeah. I mean, I, we've heard well, these stories. We've heard people. We've heard people. We've heard stories about people who used to be addicted to various substances, and now they're not. We've heard about people who were hateful, murdering, rapists, pick pick your thing, uh, or under demonic influence or whatever, and now they're not. Yeah. Um, these stories are nothing well, new. That, well, okay, but. You do realize that Cat uh, Stevens like be became a Muslim, so maybe we should offer Cat Stevens' conversion story as a counter. Yeah. 
you know. But uh, you ask you ask the question you, you ask the question why would he appear to this man and I was going to address that question. Oh, okay. That you asked. Sure. And and um, so okay the, the the reason that that in his situation being a devout Muslim um, he would you know he would pray you know throughout the day and so on and, and did all the things that he was a devout Muslim should do mm-hmm. and. And as he was in his cell and he was praying, um, he said that a, that a, a spirit appeared, and it was a very evil, evil spirit, and it was just choking the life out of him. And he said he used all the things that he knew in Islam, you know, Satan be gone, and and all of the things that he could. And he says it was absolutely nothing that was working. And he said suddenly he heard a voice that said, "Call on Jesus' name," and he said. I, he said, he says, when a man is, when you're, if a man is drowning and he's throwing, throwing you a rope, you don't ask what the color is, you just grab onto the rope. And so he, he said, um, you know, Jesus, if you are real, save me. And he said, immediately the room went back to normal. And he said, this is, that was not, the beginning of my conversion. He said that was the beginning of my confusion. He said, why would Jesus appear to a Muslim? Why would he bother to save a Muslim? He said that was totally... I don't know, maybe the, so, maybe the Muslims had heard some things about Christianity and began to feel guilty right. for the positions that he had, and his own subconscious yeah. invented this fiction in order to give him an excuse to get out from under a more barbaric religion. Possibly. Yeah. But that wasn't the end of it. Well, oh. yeah, but so he prayed. So I, 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 if I can go th- just through what he told me, and then you can respond. Well, you can, to that. but I mean, just like you know, as we said, testimonials are. I, I, you got like one minute to wrap it up. Yeah, diamond. Because yeah, okay, one minute because I don't want to take any more. But I, just to answer your question, is that look at so he prayed for two weeks, he fasted for two weeks, and he says at the end of the at the end of the situation that he said I got no answer, no answer from Allah. So he says, the heck with it. I'm going to get rid of I'm no more Quran. I'm going to do what's good for me. He says, I did the one thing that a Muslim cannot do, is deny Allah. He says, that is the unforgivable sin. He says, it was at that point that Jesus appeared to him again. Okay. Well, said, I prayed and I fasted and Jesus never showed up. And then I went ahead and did okay. the one unforgivable sin in Christianity, uh, depending on how you want to define apostasy. Yeah. Uh, and Jesus didn't intervene at all. And Allah didn't show up. And neither did the flying spaghetti monster or anybody else. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, well, okay, guys. I appreciate it. I don't yeah, want to take so appreciate it, but time. these uh, yeah, testimonials, everyone has their own. And... I, I understand the reason why they feel compelling to some people, because you'd like to trust people, mm-hmm. but there's no way they should reasonably be compelling to anyone. And it is, it is absolutely a sense of cherry-picking, because you're picking the, this one story and ignoring all well, the other stories, ignoring Dave, ignoring no Dave, ignoring all of the other stories that contradict it, the claims from other religions, the times when it didn't happen. It is, by definition, a logical fallacy. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I mean, it's just, okay. You, and you I, like that the story I sounds good. If you don't care about right. fallacies, that's your prerogative. Yeah. But if you do care about fallacies, then you cannot, cannot reach the conclusion that this individual convert story is sufficient to determine that in fact it was real and Jesus saved him. That is impossible without a fallacy. Yeah. And do you care about fallacies? Well, if you could, if you could explain to me a little bit more what you're saying right there, as far as about fallacy. Do you care whether or not what you believe is true or f- not true? Oh, of course. Okay. Of course, of course. So then you, you need a mechanism by which you can determine whether or not something's true, likely true, or not true, right? Okay. So if somebody right. makes an argument, you do understand that, for example, Aristotle and his band of merry logicians evaluated all 256 possible logistic, syllogistic forms to determine which ones were valid and which ones weren't, right? Right. Okay, and so if somebody presents an invalid syllogism, what does that mean? Invalid. Yeah, but what does it mean to say that it's invalid? Does that mean they're wrong? No, it's not true. No, that's not what it means. Well, it means that we, if it's it's a valid syllogism and the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. But if it's invalid, if it's invalid, the conclusion could be true or false. It basically means we cannot determine whether or not it's true. 
Okay? So if you have a flawed argument, it doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means that your argument does not demonstrate and cannot demonstrate that your position is correct. And so if your argument is that there is a reasonable path from this person is reporting that their life changed because Jesus appeared to them and saved them from the evil mm -hmm. darkness, none of which mm -hmm. is verifiable mm -hmm. or confirmable, mm -hmm. there's, there's a fallacy in there. Uh, you, you, depending on how you frame it, you're going to end up with an argument from ignorance fallacy, or you're going to be cherry picking, or you're going to be arguing in a circular fashion. Uh, primarily, those are, those are going to be the big ones, because what you're doing is saying this particular story is of such quality that it's the conclusion I've reached is necessarily true. And you're doing that while acknowledging that similar stories happen in other causes, back to everything that we discussed before. So if you actually want to hold beliefs, you cannot do that reasonably based on fallacious arguments. So if I, if I had, you know, a, a long enough life and could talk to enough people of varying beliefs... No. Could I conceivably come to some no. conclusion where there is no, 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 because no? the truth of a proposition mm -hmm. isn't affected in any way by the number of people who believe it, how strongly they mm -hmm. believe it, how willing they are to die for it. None of those things affect whether or not they, what they believe is actually true. You need evidence for it. Even if everybody on the planet believed in Jesus, that doesn't mean that Jesus is real. Just like when most people believe the earth was flat or it was the center of the universe, that doesn't make it true. So the change of a person's life radically, claiming that a particular cause caused it, does not, there's, no, there's no number of human experiences that could ever allow you to logically come to a conclusion that there's a probability that what they're saying Correct. is true. That's, right. that's, that's not, it's not possible. Correct. Cause, causal causal relationships need to be demonstrated, not assumed, avowed, affirmed, attested to through inspiration or personal experience. There has to be a concrete demonstration of causality. Okay. And without and that, that, all you're doing is post-talk reasoning. I'm, you're saying because this I'm, having positive effect, it must be a true thing. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's another fallacy, that's post-talk. Yeah. That's where I'm confused. That's where I'm confused, is that yeah. their life is the cause. You're asking for causes, and I'm looking and saying, well, they're changing their life is the cause. Mm -hmm. No, that's the effect. The change in life is the effect. Yeah. Not change in life is the effect. It, the change in life may be the okay. cause of other things, but when we want to know what is the cause of the change in their life, the only answer we have okay. right so now I'm, is we don't know. Okay, so what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying then is, I see the effects of what they're saying. Yeah. They're saying that I, there is this cause, and it has There's plenty effect, of people so. who become better yep, yep. people because okay. of a fundamental okay. change in their ideology. That change in the ideology so, becomes a cause for others. It causes, causation is a chain, everything that preceded okay. it is a chain. So we know that uh, not telling lies uh, or not doing okay. drugs may be the effect mm -hmm. of this change in their life. But now we're saying, what is the cause for the change in their life? Okay. Is, okay. It, is it a God? Right. Is it because they had right. an epiphany and took responsibility for yeah. their own life? Did they have a chemical imbalance that self-corrected, or did they get on some medication to correct? You, know, you just, you, you need to demonstrate All the right. Yeah. All right. So cool. what you're saying then is that I, I can have a myriad, uh, this incredible myriad of people who have had effects happening to them, all of them claiming that it was because of Jesus, but because I, even though I see all these effects, I can't come to a, 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 I cannot come to a conclusion that God exists just because of the effects on their lives. Correct. Okay, so, all right, all right, so you're just saying logic, I guess that, okay, now we come full circle. <laughs> That's where I, I have been somewhat frustrated in listening over the past year and a half is that there is no way to ever come to a conclusion that God really exists based on, based on using that method of thinking. And yet you seem to have come to that conclusion, which is why we had this long conversation. Yeah. Okay, 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 that's fair. Cool, so think yeah, about it some more. We'll look forward to hearing you, and, yeah. hear from you Pardon? in the future. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. Let's go from uh, one David to another, uh, but this one on the atheist end of the spectrum. David in Temecula, thanks for waiting. How are you doing? Hi, how's it going? Just fine. Thank you for waiting. Pretty well. All right, so I have um, what I call upping the ante on Pascal's wager. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I just say, okay, let's assume the Bible's true. Let's assume, you know, all of it's good. Um, the heart of the argument 
is that you have to do everything you can, <clears throat> excuse me, everything you can in this world to ensure you get to heaven, right? Okay. And um, I just think that there's more that Christians need to be doing. I know they believe it's not based on works, but how do they know Jesus would be okay with them owning a TV while children are starving? I mean, he said a lot of things about rich people not getting into heaven. Mm -hmm. Westerners are pretty rich by uh, worldly standards. So I would think that if you don't sell everything you own and give it to the poor, then you're not doing everything you possibly can. Oh, see, that's, that's the fundamental heaven. flaw here. You're actually listening to what Jesus said, and the Christian yeah. church is based on what Paul said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Americans hate the idea of socialist Jesus. Yeah. Oh, they don't. Uh, yeah. The hippy dippy. I have no job. I'm going to travel around with a bunch of dudes and sponge off of everybody else while I tell them the secrets of the universe. They have their own sort uh, of libertarian free market Jesus that they've yeah. come up with. You know, <laughs> uh, you know it's sort of people create God in their own image. What can you say? Soteriology is the study of what is actually required for salvation, and one of the things is that even amongst Christianity, even among Christendom, uh, there's no one yeah. answer. It's Salvation by grace through faith works are or aren't irrelevant. Uh, is this something that you can do? Is this a gift that God bestows on you? You could desperately try your entire life to do exactly what it is that God wants you to do, and he can still say, nope, you're not one of the chosen few. You're not one of the elect, which is how you get, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists. And yeah. of the thousand denominations, they disagree on every single point of doctrine, in some cases, including whether or not Jesus even existed as a person. So, but it's all one truth. The only time your argument's actually useful is if you can first get someone to say, yes, I live by the words of Jesus. And then you can say, okay, when Jesus was specifically asked, Master, what must I do to achieve heaven? What was his answer? Now, likely they're not going to be able to answer because most people don't actually know what they believe or what their Jesus that yeah. they love so much actually said. But his instruction was to keep the commandments. And then when they, they asked him, well, which commandments? Uh, he specifically listed commandments, not all ten of them. Um, and the, the guy says, you know, Master, I've done that. You're, you're familiar with the verse because you got to the finale, which is, you know, then sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor. Why aren't they doing mm -hmm. that? Well... That's a good question, but it only applies to the people who might actually know. And what you're probably going to get in response is, yes, but the Bible says this thing or this other thing or this other thing as well. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's Christians, a great tactic. Actually, <laughs> I mean, I've asked them on forums, and they say, well, well I don't think I have to do that or whatever. <laughs> and my, my, the whole point, of, though, is I'm saying it, doing so will not decrease your chances in the, of getting into heaven. And the heart of the wager argument is... Uh, this world doesn't mean anything. No matter what happens to you in this world, is meaningless because it's all about the uh, winning the uh, the bet of you know eternal damnation or eternal bliss. So why not do everything you possibly can to increase your chances of getting into heaven? This would increase it. Yeah, my, it cannot decrease. I think the best response to the wager is to point out that even if I wanted to get into the Christian heaven, which I don't at least not any of them that I've been presented with, um, then I need to do whatever it takes. But because there's no clear path to decide what I should do, then the best thing I can possibly do is to live an intellectually honest life. Because if I adopted one of the various versions of Christianity, I would be doing it for the purpose of trying to fool a God into thinking that I had done the right thing when I don't have any good way of determining which is the right thing. So being a non-believer is, in fact, the best path to a potential heaven, because any God that is wise and good in any fashion could not punish someone for living an intellectually honest life and saying, I don't have enough information to make a decision between these, so I'm going to reserve judgment until such time as I have enough information. It could be that this is one big IQ yeah. test, yeah. <laughs> and the people who are buying into a particular yeah. doctrine have failed. I mean, who was one other thing said, I wanted to mention uh, real quickly. Ben Franklin or somebody okay. said... Uh, I can't believe that the God who endowed us with reason intended us to forego its use. Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're right. This could all be, could be, uh, this could, religion could be the ultimate trolling of the human race. Hey, I want you to kill your kid for me because I'm good. Okay, God. Ah, just messing with you. Don't, not, All no. right. Anyway, David, you had one last thing you wanted to get to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, contradictions in the Bible are the reason I lost my faith. And um, I was thinking about it. And I came to the conclusion, hey, wait a minute, Satan is credited at every opportunity as being clever, 
He's more powerful than any human. Mm -hmm. And if the scribes who were doing everything that they possibly could to preserve the Bible screwed up anyways, right, then why can't Satan, at the very least, match our blunders and corrupt the Bible on his own? I mean, why can he not do that? If, you're, if the answer is there's some sort of hedge of protection that Satan cannot penetrate, then why does God allow men to screw it up and not Satan? There's, yeah. what, there's no sensible answer to that. Correct. You are absolutely right. Yeah, so I've, I've never got, I've, I'm actually asking that question to people right now, and I've, not a single one of them can give me an answer. In fact, they don't even mention Satan when they're answering. They're, they think it's a question about just contradictions. And my point is Satan could have altered the Bible and you wouldn't even know. Yeah, and it goes back to the question that I like to ask when it comes down to morality. How did you decide that God is the good one and Satan is the evil one? By <laughs> definition, yeah. now what they'll say is, well, God yeah. has written his code on their heart. Well, my answer is, if I'd written my moral code on my heart, you would be judging me good. And that's completely independent of whether or not I'm actually good. And mm -hmm. uh, if Satan had written his code on your heart, you'd be judging that Satan's a good one. So clearly that's not a solution. So what we're really saying is that you have made a value judgment based on your own fallible reasoning and reach the conclusion that God is the good one. Now please justify it. Justify the mass murdering, uh, anti-woman, pro-slavery, uh, slaughter, feed me blood and smoke, let me kill my own son hey, to, serve, cool. to serve as a loophole yeah. to rules that I created. It, the only way I can love you is if I first kill my son and then let you, okay, please prove to me that, the, that this is good, because it's unrecognizable by any standard of good that I could remotely hope to accept. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of atheists like to say, I don't know if you guys say it, but, you know, the Bible was written by goat herders, which I doubt because Jacob had a weird idea of how to Because they were goats, illiterate. So I don't know how can... <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, the Bible was written by racist, sexist, genocidal, slave-driving, maniac rapists. <laughs> and... and uh, I mean, to call them goat herders, I think, is a uh, pretty... It's an insult to goat herders. In Those people favor. are actually out there doing real damn work to get us really good cheese mm -hmm. and clothes, but <laughs> mostly cheese. Yeah. Anyway, exactly. thanks, David. I appreciate the call. Thank you. I love the show. Thanks, Bye. Seeker. I mean, most you can say is that you know, the Bible is the best thing you can say about it is that it is the product of a pre-scientific, pre-modern, pre-enlightened, very cruel, primitive culture. Oh, I think the best thing I could say about it is that read properly, it creates atheists. But yeah. Isaac Asimov, yeah, salt of that one. But oh well. all right, everybody, strap in. I'm ready. Hamish, thanks for waiting. How you doing? Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, we can barely hear you. Oh. I I heard you for a Hello? moment. Hello. Hello. There you are. Uh, you've got to turn off your stream. I'm, I'm hearing the echo delayed. So turn off your stream and listen to the phone or whatever device you're using. Yeah, mute, mute, you'll need to mute your PC or whatever. It is done. All right. What have you got for us this week? I call and discuss a topic which has been deeply disturbing me, especially recently and late. We're having a very hard time to hear, hearing you. You're fading in and out. So if you can just kind of get to the question, that'd be useful. Do you think that Islam is the worst religion? Probably. Yeah. It's really hard to say. Um, so, so one of the things is if you do a study, for example, of let's say, and there was a recently a study done of the Quran versus the Bible. The Bible advocates more violence and contains more violence. Um, so if you went back to just the holy books and said which one is worse, well, you could use that as a way to judge it. Um, quite frankly, we were more likely to judge it based on the actions of, it, of its adherents and what kind of society results when adherence to that is put into power. And so with, with Islamic regimes being pretty much the only theocracies, looking at where those things are in place, um, they, are not, they don't tend to be societies uh, that are very uh, progressive or value human life. Um, we certainly have a lot of... Uh, terrorist action coming from those, uh, the more fundamentalist aspects of those religions, but you, you can't, you could also make a case that, okay, which religion currently has 
the greatest power base and is likely to take over the world, in which case I would say that religion might be judged the most dangerous. And I don't know that that's easy to determine because while that's, it's true for Islam in many areas, it's not true everywhere. And we can't really predict the future because it may be the case that we would allow a religion to become pretty bad. And the second it tries to step just a little further over the line, there's a massive backlash to it. Um, but, but based on religions in practice, the one that I think is most directly harmful to both its adherents and its detractors is probably Islam in various forms. Do you find, as I find, that there is a great problem with the regressive left? I don't even really know what the regressive left is. Sometimes I get labeled regressive left, sometimes I don't. Um, there are a number of, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a number of videos uh, kind of covering topics like this, but I don't know what it has to do with this TV show. Yeah. I, I think, and I think that the term regressive left is just a dog whistle. It doesn't really, you know, the people who use it never explain exactly what is being regressed from or regressed towards. Well, I can explain. Additionally, you might have a problem with a certain yeah. ideology in one area. Like somebody asked me the other day, what religion represents the greatest threat? Well, I'm not going to say Islam. Worldwide, it may be Islam. It's not the greatest threat in Austin. It's not the greatest threat in Texas. It's not the greatest threat in the United States because there isn't a sufficient power base here. You know, you're talking about occasional massive terrorist actions, yes. But when you look at the sort of Christian terrorism that occurs where you have abortion clinic bombings and things like the KKK and stuff, while well, the KKK is, KKK is pretty much irrelevant except for when they're supporting candidates. Yeah. Um, but well, it's, we've seen an emboldening of that aspect of American culture recently. When, when, we're, when we're talking about which religion is most likely to affect my rights and the rights of people close to me geographically, uh, Islam has pretty much negligible impact and, and serves negligible risk to my rights. When we're, when we're at a point right now where we're dealing with you know, a woman's right to bodily autonomy, uh, I'm more concerned about what's going on in the Supreme Court than, you know, with Al-Qaeda or Hamas or whoever you want to point to as a potential threat. That's not true everywhere. There are other places where it clearly represents the biggest threat. I just think uh, the history of the human race is, is one in which you can clearly see any time religion has inordinate political power, uh, it, it results in great harm. You know, right now we've got Islam, I think, unless I'm much mistaken, they're the, the those are the only active theocracies right now in the world, like actually running countries. Um, I'm not positive. Well, don't, yeah, not sure. perhaps active, because but most yeah. countries have a state religion. So, yeah. but, I mean, but in terms of like being theocratic, that's different from like an actual theocratic society. I would say, like having a state religion doesn't necessarily mean a theocracy. But um, you know, but if you look back at you know 16th century Spain or most of medieval Europe, when when those those were Christian theocracies, and they were extremely cruel cultures as well. Uh, so I think just the idea is keep. This is why we need separation of church and state, and we need to we need to always you're, curb. Um, Amos, you're really breaking up and, yeah, and difficult. Really but but all. try. Go ahead. We are talking about modern time. Yeah, I, I was talking. I was talking about modern time. Yeah. Very well. Um, I do have. One thing to say. You're not, we, we're not getting you, Hamish. We're not hearing you. I heard his phone buzz. Yeah. Last chance. Yeah. Oh, well. Goodbye. Yeah. <sighs> All right, so we've got uh, Dustin in Central South Carolina. Thanks for waiting. Hey, is that Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. And a baby. <laughs> Uh, and a baby. I'm leaving that room right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's all good. I, I don't. I don't like listening to it any more than you do. Um, hey, um, I've got a couple questions. Uh, both are epistemology based. Um, if time allows, I'd love to get to them both. But I'll start with the one that I um, had told the call screener I would ask. <laughs> um, you kind of hit on it. With the first caller, Dave, yeah. he was talking about the pragmatic, the pragmatic effects. So the answer to the question is no. Right. So, because but I you can ask the question. 
No, that's okay. I'm going to modify it to maybe make it a little bit more interesting. Well, just, just so people know, the, the question that was listed was, do the pragmatics of effects of a belief affect whether or not it's true? No. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so I figured you'd say that. So if you'd allow me, I'd love to revise it. Sure. Um, maybe, maybe instead I'll ask, do correct beliefs ever, um, are they ever detrimental? And of are course. false beliefs ever, ever beneficial? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes to both? Yes to both. Mm -hmm. For example, okay. the, the, the example I've used before is you're trapped in a mine. You might believe that praying is likely to extend your life, and so you pray, and your life is extended. You've increased the, the chances that you're being rescued. You're using less oxygen because you're calm. But So there's a false belief that is, that is giving a, a positive benefit. As far as a true belief that might have a negative benefit, um, if I am told that I have cancer and it's true, uh, believing that may have a negative effect on my life. It could ha also have a positive effect uh, in how I determine to live the rest of my life, but it's certainly generally viewed as a negative to find out that you, in fact, have cancer. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I'm, and there are I'm probably other examples that are better. I don't know. No, that's good. Uh, I may tack on a follow-up question to that, and that would be, if we're trying to discern if a claim is true or false, is it even worth asking if the results of believing that are going to be uh, valuable? Is it, does it even add to the conversation? Only, only if belief is a, is a tie to the results. It, it, only if belief is tied to the results. Because So if you, if you said, um, I'm going to have a hard time coming up with an example. If the, if the discussion a, is one about the positive or the negative, you know, the, the constructive or the deleterious effects of believing, belief, versus what is the actual truth of the claim of this belief. Those are separate discussions. So yeah, if you're, if you're talking about, well, what beliefs, in what way do people believe things that actually help them psychologically and otherwise in their lives? I'd, I'd have a hard time coming up with an example, because for yeah. example, you know, I, I'm working on a, a number of examples that make use of a calculator. Um, and so this calculator I've got is either going to give the correct answer or it's not. And what I believe about the calculator doesn't have any impact on it at all. So I think the only sure. category of things we're talking about, uh, the effect of beliefs, are where we're, the claim is about, in nature, about the effects of beliefs. You know, like, uh, because we know that false beliefs can have positive effects, we could say, okay, irrespective of what or, whether or not the foundational belief is true, we want to look at the effects, and part of the reason for this is that until we find out what the actual cause is, it might be a good idea to encourage belief. We see this a lot of, you can do it, you can be president, you can be anything, uh, the, the kind yeah. of encouragement that's op optimistic. We probably realize that our kid is not, in fact, the brightest and most beautiful <laughs> and is probably not going to end up being president. But we believe in belief. We believe in encouraging towards this goal uh, as something positive. And if it turns out, in, in going back to the, you know, trapped in a cave landslide example, it turns out that the thing about prayer that is likely to extend your life is that it calms you down. If instead you could teach everybody to be calm, then you can get rid of the prayer entirely. And if they're in that situation, merely knowing that they're being calm might or might not be enough to make them calm and extend their chances of being sa uh, sure. rescued, saved, saved. Sure. There I got saved from a mind. Criticisms that I've read recently of, you know, the new atheists, which is that, well, the atheists just don't get it, right? They're all focused on the scientific aspect of it, like, well, can you prove this is true, prove this or prove that, when uh, you don't understand that the, the reason that people, you know, it's the emotional effect, it's the, um, it's the, there are benefits of belief, and then they go all down the list of, of, of exactly what uh, Dave was talking about earlier. Yeah. And it's not, no, it isn't that the new atheists don't get it, so we understand, but we're, we just think that it should matter yeah. whether or yeah. not what you believe is actually true. And I think that, that what differentiates, I, I th you talk to a lot of atheists, I think you'll find uh, many of them will, will, will tell you in one form or another that, it, especially if they started out as a theist or as a practicing you know, a Christian or whatever religion that they were raised in, They'll tell you that they eventually reached a point in their lives where they decided that it actually did matter whether or not the things they believed were in fact true. And, Absolutely. Um, here's a here's the kind of the way I look at it. Yeah. 
Whereas believers have let's this say it's true for me kind of way of thinking. Well, yes, which, uh, we're not. It just means that it makes me feel good. No, that's, that's just garbage. The yeah. true for me thing is garbage, implying that oh, we agree. all have our own truths. Yeah. So here's the way I look I at it. It's a way of avoiding. Either there is a God or there isn't. If it turns out that believing a God exists provides some positive benefits, it's in our best interest to figure out whether or not there is a God. Because if there's positive, in, uh, positive results from believing, there are people who cannot believe because they're actually engaged in rational thought and realize that you're supporting these beliefs with fallacies. So they're never right. going to get that benefit because they can't yeah. believe in a God. And so if we find out that, in fact, there is a God and we have good reason for it, now those people have access to that positive benefit. And if we find out that the positive benefit is caused by something else, like remaining calm in the face of disaster, now those people who can't accept a God will have access to that positive benefit. That's why the truth that's matters. Great. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's a good explanation. Thanks, Dustin. I appreciate the call. Oh, okay. I just got time for a second question, or am I done? Oh well, yeah. Make, go ahead. We got we got time. Make a yeah, quick question quick. for us. Wonderful. I appreciate that. Uh, it's it's real quick. Uh, I wondered if you would accept the philosophy of basal assumptions, and if so, how do you respond to the presuppositionalist that says belief in God is properly basic? <laughs> okay. So first of all, I just did a two-hour panel this afternoon on presuppositionalism. Uh, anybody who's arguing using Bayesian analysis isn't a presuppositionalist. They're involved in some sort of evidential or classical uh, apologetics, which we actually discussed along those lines. Um, okay. I have a problem using uh, Bayesian analysis to assess the God situation because I think the uh, hypothesis that they're suggesting uh, the probability of something on theism, the hypothesis they've, they're suggesting is one that is manufactured specifically to fit the scenario and one for which we have no map uh, to determine a probability within reality. And so I think they've taken Bayesian analysis and moved it well outside of the, the area where it could do any good. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, where can I find that? You said you did a two-hour session on presuppositionalism? Go, to, go to my Facebook page, and somewhere today I posted a link to it, uh, and also Dan Linford and Ozymandias and others were in it. Um, it's posted okay. on somebody's YouTube channel, but yeah, we had a big, long discussion about presupp apologetics. I'd love to check it out. Thanks for cool. the time. Thanks, Dawson. Appreciate it. See ya. So we've hit the hour mark, but we're not stopping. No. You can't stop us. That's right. And after the show is over, people involved with the show get together and uh, go to Threadgills, which I keep wanting to say is Riverside, but it's not Riverside. No. It's, uh, it's on uh, Lamar. No, Lamar. Other way. Yeah, th yeah, th yeah. that way, on that Lamar. Way. This way, if you were sitting here in the actual studio, so your monitor you might be facing monitor. a completely different direction if you're like in Zimbabwe or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you might have to, like if you're in Australia, you'd have to turn it like this so it's pointing roughly downish. And that only counts in Perth, by the way. Perth, as I found out, is this, my wife and I live in here in Austin. And when we went to Australia, it was interesting to discover that Perth is as close to the antipode as I can get. When I was in Australia, I was as far away from my wife as I could possibly be without boarding a boat or a spaceship. Huh. So it's like the, the exact point, almost. It just makes me want to strive harder to find ways to get farther away. But oh. it was cool to get to... Oh. I'm just kidding. She's not watching. She's taking a nap, I'm sure of it. Somebody <laughs> sleeping in the garage. Uh, but, it, yeah, it was fun. And, uh, and, and Perth was uh, lovely and not at all the most boring city uh, that some people would like to claim it was. People say that about Perth? Yeah, it evidently it's, nice. it's, you know, it's the Western Australia. It doesn't get all the, mm. the flash of Sydney and Brisbane, Melbourne, and stuff like yeah. that. I, but I, I love all, all my, uh, my Australian friends and my New Zealand friends, by the way. We, we were there, and that was great as well. Um, we've got somebody on line five that just says, brand new atheist in Findlay, Ohio. Are you there? Hi. Can Hi. you hear me all right? We can. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, I, I never really thought I'd be calling the atheist experience. Uh, it's uh, uh, glad to finally come around to it. Um, I'm, uh, like like my uh, title says, I'm, I'm basically a new atheist, but I still have a few uh, Christian residue, I guess you could say. You know, I still have a few um, yeah. ideas I'm trying to work through. Mm -hmm. um, That's pretty common. I'll, I'll try to make it. <laughs> I'll try to make it quick because I know you guys are on a schedule. Um, but 
basically, uh, um, I guess uh, a lot of the things I hear from atheists, um, like when when I was a Christian, um, you know, I would try to evangelize to my atheist friends, you know, about God, and uh, most of the time they would be like, um, um, well, I don't believe in the unicorn, uh, unicorns or fairies or the flying spaghetti monster, mm-hmm. and, you know, th- I- I've heard this um, from quite a few atheists, and I, I as I'm um, branching out and learning more about it, I see that a lot of atheists have this uh, type of response, and, um, and you know, I'll be uh, reading some posts on, from atheists, and um, I'll, I'll hear them say things like, um, um, like, we're... Uh, if you're an atheist, you don't believe this or that, you know. Well, like it's what? Me, because, I, it, because so far as I can tell, if you're an atheist, the only thing you have in common with other atheists is that you don't believe in God. There are plenty of irrational atheists out there who aren't skeptics, who buy into all kinds of pseudoscience and woo, and the people who say that you're only an atheist if you believe X, Y, Z, um, they're bizarrely wrong. Yeah, that's uh, no true... <laughs> It's a, it's a no okay. true Scotsman fallacy, and actually, I'll go ahead and say this here, because I'm not beholden to anybody. The current uh, or recent vice president of the Center for Inquiry, his name's Tom Flynn, and he'll occasionally post on the blog, and we'll disagree with him. He's a, he's a cantankerous curmudgeon, and he doesn't like Christmas and all this other stuff, and that's all, you know, mm-hmm. well and good. That's his prerogative, but he made a blog post recently criticizing people who went to Sunday Assembly or Oasis. These, by the way, are um, essentially gathering services. They've been called church-like or atheist church. It's just a bunch of people who like Mm -hmm. to get together and do that sort of thing where they might listen to somebody or sing a song or whatever else. And he made a blog post saying that these people aren't really secular. And I think that he should resign over this because I'd rather not see um, a prominent member of a prominent organization that's part of the secular community making pronouncements about who is or isn't properly secular, especially if they're completely mm-hmm. fucking wrong, as yeah. Tom is. Because that, you know, that's what religions do. Religions are the ones that say, here is your list of dogma, here are your lists, right. uh, here, here is your list of proper behaviors yep. uh, that you must adhere to mm-hmm. if you want to be part of the club. And if you don't do these things, or if you do the other thing, you can't be in the club. Yeah, um, Sunday um, Assembly, mm-hmm. yeah, Oasis. It's like that. I mean, you know, that's... The, in fact, aren't we supposed to be free thinkers? You would hope so. We're supposed to encourage right. these sorts of, you know, differences uh, in terms. There's no real. You, you start policing other people's atheism and say, "Sorry, you're atheisting wrong." No. Uh, the right. only time I, the only time I ever go to Sunday Assembly or Oasis is when I've been asked to come there as a speaker because mm-hmm. that sort of environment uh, is not for me, but it is for other people. And there's no way I could say, you're not sufficiently secular. You're stuck in the trappings of religion. No. Religions Mm -hmm. co-opted aspects of humanity. Religions co-opted culture and community and tried to claim that it's theirs. And I am exceedingly proud of organizations like Oasis and Sunday Assembly for taking that back and saying, you know, you don't get to have that. That's about us as people. This doesn't. This is not a church thing, uh, and right. uh, and even even if it's not your thing, it's not my thing. It's somebody's thing. Mm-hmm. And I, yes, I'm I'm livid about this particular issue, yeah. because we have a lot of people who are new, who are finding their way out of religions, and there are support organizations like Recovering from Religion, which does a good job. There are there's mm-hmm. a secular therapist project. There are more and more therapists beginning to recognize what's been called religious trauma syndrome that people's long term indoctrination into religious beliefs once they find their way out causes harm. They lose their social circles. They're sometimes caught off from their family. Um, but the fact that you're going to disparage someone because they might want to hang out with other people and sing a song and listen to somebody talk because you think it's a little mm-hmm. about too much like church, I'll tell you this, Tom Flynn's definitely secular, but he's not a very good humanist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, well, uh, thanks. That, uh, that, uh, I, I like that response. Um, uh, I guess another thing um, where I... I uh, I shared what a lot of atheists would respond to when I would ask the question, uh, if you believe in God, you know, when we got on that subject, you know, they would mostly say the same thing. Um, 
um, well, I don't believe in unicorns, so and so, and and I got to thinking. Well, if someone asks me the ask me what two plus two is, I'm going to keep answering them for. You know, I'm not going to change my answer, and I I, I guess uh, I'm trying to scale that up to um, the the over ideas that uh, the general ideas that atheists share. Um, are they that concrete? Like two plus two equaling four. Therefore, you can't really, you know, give another answer, you know, you're just, you know, got to keep kind of reinforcing it. Are, are you following me at all? I'm not sure if I'm following you. What I'd say is that atheism isn't the position, there are no gods necessarily, that's contained within it. Atheism is the position of, I don't believe any of the God claims. And so that's why you get answers about fairies and other, because they're trying to show examples how the various God claims are no more justified with supporting evidence and argument than any supernatural claim or anything else. As a matter of fact, um, while I don't actually believe that there are, in fact, intelligent aliens elsewhere in the universe, what I believe mm -hmm. is that the universe is huge and that it would be arrogant for us to presume that we were, in fact, the only ones. We might be the first. There might have been a long line in other areas. But I don't have evidence to conclude that it is, in fact, the case that there are aliens. But the aliens claim, even the absurd claim that they are repeatedly, continually visiting us on Earth, um, which we have good reason to think is wrong, is still more believable than a God claim because it doesn't necessarily include anything supernatural. It's all natural. This, you know, hey, we've got spaceships and there's life that's evolved in other places and they make it here. We don't have to violate the laws of physics and appeal to magic and the supernatural mm -hmm. to come up with aliens. And so until such time as somebody demonstrates that the supernatural is real, it is by, mm -hmm. by default less uh, of a probable solution uh, than f from our perspective than the natural. Okay. Yeah, that, that that makes that makes sense. Um, I, uh, I do. I have time for one more question. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, so um, so I, I'm 21 right now. Like so, I'm fairly young. But um, I uh, um, I'm trying to word this right. Like I, I I'm pretty firm in you know being an atheist now. Like. Like now, I realize that even if the God of the Bible was true, I don't. I don't see him as a God worth worshiping just because of his uh, character described in the Bible. But um, my grand, I, I live with my grandmother at the moment, um, mm -hmm. and she's very religious. Like, um, and I don't. I, I don't think she knows that I'm an atheist yet. But um, I just recently bought a book from Richard Dawkins, and uh, she found it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and uh and she she's on to me now um you know it's so like, strange that it's like you yeah. know i can remember trying to hide porn from yeah. my folks and now we're hearing from people having to hide <laughs> atheist yeah, books uh, well you know you are 21 right so that's uh, yeah. this whole adulthood yeah. thing is 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 a deal that she's going to have to get yeah if you were old enough to be fed this crap when you were a little kid you're definitely old enough to be able to consider other opinions Right, yeah. and um, like what what I want to get to is uh, my grandmother. She, you know, she's old age. Uh, like she she's almost she's getting to her time, you know. And um, like what I feel like like she's happy in what she believes. And like, should I be really even trying to convince her, or should I just you know? I don't what, try to convince my grandmother. I don't even really try to convince my parents. I mean, we, we had to come to an agreement to just not discuss this. They know what my views are. They know we don't agree. And they're not going to change their mind based on any, pretty much anything that I offer. That's not true for everybody. Dan Barker uh, became an atheist, and his parents you know, also did afterwards. Um, but mm -hmm. it, you have to decide what's more important. And for me, having a good relationship with my parents and my grandparents is more important than, they, than that they believe exactly like me. Unless I had some knockdown argument that was just obvious that I knew would appeal to them, I would definitely mm -hmm. share it. Um, I don't know, you know, since I don't have this argument, I don't know what their reaction would be. Um, okay. But, you, you know... My my only inclination to try to change, like if I had a family member or someone like that, if I, and, and to really confront them and change their minds, 
would mm -hmm. need to entail were their beliefs causing them to live their lives yes. in ways that were destructive to themselves and others. And at that point, I might step in and, yes. and, and try to really. But, you know, if you want to talk about grandma who, you know, sits in her chair and does crosswords and knits and is very charming and makes lovely brownies and really isn't hurting mm -hmm. soul, yeah, you know, it's, I, I would I right. much rather have, uh, you know, a, a wonderful relationship with my grandmother in the time she has left. It's about it's about it's, being mm -hmm. open and honest. You, yeah. you should probably be willing to discuss it if they express an interest and want to. And if they express an interest in not having the discussion, then you should respect that because you don't owe anybody an explanation. They don't owe you an explanation. And I'm completely in agreement mm -hmm. with Martin, and I'm very glad he, he brought that up uh, because we have just, you know, in the past couple of weeks, another couple incidents of people whose kids are now dead because they opted for yeah. prayer instead of actual medicine. And if I had family members who were... Uh, putting their own health or the health of their kids at risk over opting for mm -hmm. religious beliefs instead of real science, I would step in and probably even more forcefully if they were doing it, you know, if they chose to do this for themselves, I would definitely step in and show them I care and try to point them to the science. But if they do it to their kids, yeah. I'm definitely stepping in to the full extent of the law, including trying to get those kids right. taken away, because I'd rather lose a relationship with an aunt and uncle than lose mm -hmm. a niece and nephew yeah. permanently. Uh, yeah, yeah th that that's I, I, stuff's despicable. Yeah, there's there's, there's definitely a, a time you need to step in. I agree. fortunately, the overwhelming uh, majority of believers don't fall into that category. These are the yeah. Easter, Christmas, Jesus loves me, let me slap a Merc and flag on my car, <laughs> and and vote for whoever's opposed to abortion, uh, which is a problem. But, but it's not, uh, it's not now, the same. Now, you've said that since your grandmother has you know, found your stash of atheist porn, <laughs> uh, it is possible. Now, you, you are now possibly facing a scenario where maybe this is a little troubling to her. And I think it's, it, at that point, I think you could just make it known that, hey, if you, wanna, if you want to talk about this, and if you have any questions for me, if you want to know why I'm doubting religion or have, have chosen to, you know, forsake religion and be secular, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly delighted to answer any questions you may have and, and have a lovely discussion over breakfast or what have you, you know, um, a conversation about it. Just you might be in for a surprise as well. Yeah. There's a lot of people yeah. who, when they open up about these things, they find out that even some of the people who they thought were pretty religious really aren't mm -hmm. and it'll be you know oh yeah i kind of always suspected it was bullshit but you know i kept going anyway or everybody else in the family was there and i didn't want to be the one to buck that you know the horse hair i think uh, the one thing that mm -hmm. if you if you have that discussion the one thing that she will discover that might be a concern to her at the moment is that oh lo and behold you're still you yeah you know mm -hmm. you just you you are thinking about things differently uh, but you're still her grandson, and you're not. You're the same person, and nothing's really changed there. But now you have something mm -hmm. else to be open with one another about, and that's actually that's an improvement upon the relationship. It's really hard to look at a group of people as if they are evil and the enemy when you happen to love right. one of them. Yeah, which is why yeah. we now have marriage equality in the United States. <laughs> Because after yeah. forever and a day of trying to vilify people because they happen to be attracted to people of the same gender. Uh, there's still, you know, a good chunk of the country who would very much turn back. That, that, oh, in a heartbeat. Yeah, but I also yeah, saw a study that's that's saying that criteria. there were, like, well, I'm not going to cite the study because I haven't verified it. But evidently mm -hmm. there are some people who aren't in, who think the Emancipation Proclamation was a mistake. But uh, I'm hoping that this was a, an article that Snopes can debunk because mm -hmm. I'm terrified that a percentage this high of any subset of American population. Let's just say that recent months have led me to think that there is no degree to which I can... <laughs> there, there are always going to be, be people who do, do and say terrible things. Yeah, anyway, uh, people can be. by all means, we wish you all the luck. Uh, you, you have to, you know, be as open as yeah. you're comfortable with. You, you're the one who decides yeah. what works best for your relationships in cooperation with the other right. people who are in those relationships. Uh, feel free to mm -hmm. email. You can also look for recovering from religion organizations to maybe meet up with some other people okay. who are in a similar situation, and call back sometime. Okay. Let us know how it's going. Yeah. Uh, hey, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your time. Take right. care. Yep, have a good one. I already mentioned thread gills, didn't I? You have done. Okay. Because yes. like. Told them it was to the left of their. Yes, that's this, right. This was last week I did like a ninety-minute show, and never once yeah. mentioned it, but and it turned out like nobody went. <clears throat> but, oh, it was all your fault. 
Um, let's see. Well, this might be interesting. Another David in Vancouver, British Columbia. Thanks for waiting. Hey, Matt. Long-time fan. David from Vancouver. Greetings. I was in Vancouver last year. Oh, no way. You were in uh, Kelowna, I believe, not Vancouver. Oh, no. I, I was in uh, Vancouver for Imagine No Religion 5. Oh, dang. Oh, okay. I wish I knew. Uh, I think I, think I was there. in Vancouver. Well, anyway, anyway go ahead. We're, we're talking to you now. So, yeah. I don't know where I'm at oh, now. Okay. How could I know then? You're at Thread Gills right now. <laughs> um, anyway, child. yeah. Um, so, like I was ta uh, talking to the screener, um, immigrated to Canada and uh, was never really religious. Almost got baptized because there's so much uh, targeting towards new immigrants here uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, the Watchtower people, the uh, hmm. uh, and the Christians, oh. and less so from the Catholic, I'd say. But anyway. Um, so all of that bombardment got me all interested in, like, you know, researching what this is all about, like, why and this and that. Um, so when I was 14, I almost got baptized because I don't know what that meant. And my parents freaked out uh, and pulled me away from all that equipment. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to research this. So later, there was a lot of debates, you know, in school and at work about Christians. And sometimes I get interested, so I get debate, you know, you know with some people who actually believe this stuff. So then I found out about your show by Googling all these questions they ask. So, so hang um, on, for one second, hang on. Um, so your parents kind of freaked yeah. out. Are, are your parents the ones, are they the first generation immigrants to Canada? Or what? Yeah. So they're originally from China? China. I was born in China. I was. Uh, you were born I, in China as well. Here. So what about, yeah, if, I, I, what, what, are, what are their religious views and what about it freaked them out? Uh, they're... I was going to say agnostic, but I learned from your show, pretty much atheist. They are both atheists. I am as well. Um, they just didn't like, uh, you know, they, they view Christianity as some, something uh, that's more of a cult than a religion. So they didn't like me getting involved with uh, people that, that they don't believe in uh, some of the crazy things they believe. So that's why. Yeah, I will say that by and large, uh, as somebody coming from a Southern Baptist background, uh, the Christians who are, who are more likely to knock on your door kind of weirded me out a little bit, too. The only time we knocked on somebody's door was after they came and visited the church and filled out the little visitor card, and then we would go visit them. I, I, I get uh, Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on my door. I don't get Jews. I don't tend to get Catholics. Very rarely mm -hmm. Southern Baptists, but it, Mormons for sure. Mm -hmm. But anyway, please continue. Right. Uh, so... I mean, uh, I know time's limited, so I'm trying to you know, brief this up. Um, so, of course, you know, first they send a, a couple of Canadians, uh, Caucasians, then they find out we're from China, then they send a couple of Chinese-speaking uh, person, mm -hmm. and they try to, like, bring a lot of commonality, like, oh, what do you like, you know, you like uh, this and that. Oh, you know, we have people that like that. Also, you know, who succeeded in this field was also a Christian. You know, you should believe this stuff, which is, I find it weird and, like, illogical. Then I invite them back into you know the home, and then we start talking about some of the points that they're talking about. So I just want them to back up any of their claims with some some sense of logic or trace of reason, and they fail to do so. So you know it's it's kind of weird that they they think this stuff is uh, built on solid ground. So I always think it's weird. And then finally there was a guy at work who said, "Hey, I'm not a religious guy, but I'm a Jesus person. Come talk to me if you're interested," which is highly unprofessional in a way because he's in a management position so mm. i took up on a challenge and then talked to him about three hours at the end. he basically said well then you had to take the leap of faith after all the stuff we talked about and i said well doesn't that mean you just conceded that you know you lost this fight because you basically admit to me that you have nothing more to build from a to b but a leap of faith yeah and i can take a face towards any any uh, conclusion and if you think then you can believe in anything you want, which is magical and wonderful, and it's not true, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, and then one of the reasons I brought up in the conversation, one of the reasons I want to talk about, uh, you know, this stuff today is I find it weird when they talk about this religion, which is encompassing of, of all the worlds, you know, how God everything. How come they never account for any of the phenomenons and events and the history that happened in China? Well, because I find, maybe, that's just my personal opinion, this all of this stuff they brew up, and all the apologists, uh, they come up with re reasons 
without even considering the outside world, which is, you know, Well, you, you, you consider yeah. you're talking about, for example, you go back to the Old Testament and, and Jewish history, and you have this story about the Exodus, which I think we can reasonably conclude did not happen. The, there's no archaeological <laughs> evidence for it. There is no sociological evidence for it. You know, it's not like there's a merging of language between, you know, Hebrew and, and uh, it, the ancient Egyptian languages. There's no records for it outside of the Bible. Uh, the numbers that they give for things are patently absurd. Uh, it would have been three million plus able-bodied men or whatever. If they stood hand to hand, it would have stretched from where they were enslaved to, to where they were going. Uh, that's, that's the kind of thing. There's all kinds of stuff. And then they make claims about a global flood. Um, yeah, why don't any of these other civilizations that were older record right. these events? If there were, you know, So what a lot of modern Christians will do is say, well, it wasn't a global flood, it was a regional flood. Okay, then first of all, I don't care about it. You know, big deal, there was a regional flood. That It has no theological foundation. How do you wipe out the sinful people all around the world if you're just going to flood this, you know, the Nile Valley or, or something along those lines? Wow. Uh, and... I think you're right in pointing out that um, this is born of ignorance and there are things that clearly contradict some of the claims once we learn more about what went on in other places. Right. Not only that, and like you were talking about, uh, obviously you have a, knowledge, a lot more knowledge in this subject matter than uh, uh, me and a lot of other people, but you know, it's not even internally logically sound. Like they con they self contradict, and uh, I mean I, I I watch your show enough to see how sometimes they have blind spots when they look at reason and they just don't see how they're contradicting themselves in the same sentence. Maybe it's a. Uh, in some cases, they will they will flat out say as as a conversation I had a week or so ago that they don't really care that much about reason. The if P then Q sort of logic is mental masturbation, which was what one Christian told me. And at that point, we no longer can have any discussion about their theological claims. We have to set all of that aside and have a discussion about reason and logic, about how to go about determining whether something is believable. And if we can't come to agreement on that, then we're not going to be able to have any sort of productive discussion. Because, you know, if, if I walk in with a yardstick, and you walk in with a meter, and we can't agree which one of us, which measurement we're going to use, or that we're going to use both of them and point to, you know, the, the, the point where they are, and both of them write both of them down. If we can't even do that, then there's no way we can agree to how long this table is or how wide this table is. Yeah, I mean, if you don't, if right. you don't have, if you don't understand, if a person doesn't understand even why they believe the things that they believe, if they don't, if they can't dis lay out the mechanism for how they distinguish a truth from a falsehood, and, f and if they go so far as to mm -hmm. say they, they openly don't care, mm -hmm. why, should I, why should I listen to anything you have to say? At yeah, that point? and then we're back to what we had a discussion with David with earlier. But yeah. On that note, David, I want to get, try and get to one more call here before we the last couple of minutes of the show, but I appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Thanks okay. very much. You sound well, like you're doing no, great in those conversations. Yeah, so keep it up. Awesome. Thanks. All right, last call for today. My apologies to everybody else, but we have uh, Frank, who's been holding for a while in Camarillo, California. Yeah, how you doing, Matt? We're doing pretty good, or I am. Martin, you doing pretty good? I'm doing yeah. fine. Pretty well, I, for all the good. English majors who hate me when I do stuff like I that. well, yes, we are well. The <laughs> mic. My question is pretty much directed towards math, but I, I know you guys are both both there. But I, I know the math that you were one time a theist. You, you were, I think you said on the show right now you were a Baptist. A yep. Baptist. And my question is to, to you, I've, I've been following you for quite a while, is uh, did any of your views in politics change once you converted over to atheism? Yes. Do you care to elaborate? Sure. I was, uh, at, there was a period. I was probably a full-on Rush Limbaugh ditto head, uh, even have his books. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's scary. Um, yeah, although, you know, I don't necessarily align with any particular political party across the board. Uh, realistically, there's nobody who's going to accurately represent my views except me, and sometimes not even me. Uh, but... My views on a number of things changed. Basically, I had to take an inventory of all of my positions and say, okay, 
I don't think that it's right to murder people, but if my foundation for that is because the Bible says so, I need to now evaluate that and figure out, is there some other reason that it might be a bad idea to murder people? Turns out there is, and it's really obvious and stupid, and we didn't need the Bible to tell us that in the first place. And then I evaluated other positions, you know. I, I had already, even while I was still a believer, I had already kind of come around with regard to uh, gay rights and marriage equality because I served in the Navy during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and I was forced to kick people out of the Navy who were incredibly good people who did good work because some piece of shit decided to out them. That, that, that other person is the one who should have been kicked out. They were useless. Uh, they were just lashing out. And then I had to participate in, you know, removing these people from their job that they had volunteered for. Uh, and we're doing really well. And that helped change my mind. Um, I've changed my mind on... That's a, that's a direct harm that you can attribute yeah. to, you know, religious culture. Right? But a lot of things changed my mind on uh, abortion. I have a much more nuanced position on death penalty now than I ever did. You know, kill them all, let God sort them out, or whatever crap was shoveled into my head. Um, but the big key thing is that I constantly reevaluate my positions based on whatever information I have. And I just, some of them changed, some of them didn't. Um, it's not like, you know, if you think about it, even in the United States where you have primarily two parties, Democrats and Republicans, they supposedly have the same access to the same information and yet they're portrayed as reaching wildly different conclusions. That's true sometimes, but it's not true all the time. In fact, in many cases, the conclusions that they reach are almost identical, they're just marketed differently. Um, so. Yeah, my, my position changed on stuff. I'm sure Martin changed his mind on things. Yeah, some things, although I think that a lot of it, for me, what sort of prompted my moving away from uh, my religious upbringing uh, wasn't just that I, I was having a hard time you know, finding, uh, you know, rational uh, justifications or any sort of evidence for the claims that I was hearing. But it was also for the fact that I, I guess I was living in Houston at that age, and so that's deep south, Texas, very conservative culture, and I, I suppose I was maybe always leaning a bit be, towards being a bit more liberal, a bit more inclusive, a bit more progressive, and there were certain, it seemed that the Christian community generally was taking stances that I couldn't get behind for various reasons. Like I grew up, I was a real book nerd, I was very, you know, for a prolific reader, and so I would see religions getting behind things like, oh, well, this needs, to, like censorship, for example. Um, the, the rise in the 80s of Jerry Falwell and the moral majority. Uh, which I saw as being a bunch of bitty bu busybodies um, sticking their nose and things that weren't really. They were doing happen. God's work. Yeah, and so it was. It was kind of the political conservatism, the ultra conservatism, uh, that was uh, that's associated with Christianity, especially in the American South, that soured me on a lot of it. Although once I abandoned religion, I would say in my mid-teens, it still took me well into you know, 20, 25 years after that, I mean, well into adulthood, into recent years, for me to shed so many of the attitudes and, and uh, political beliefs that were, like, acculturated into my brain. Yeah. You know, I mean, it took me years. Like, for example, when, when I was very young, I was very much like, yes, gay rights and shouldn't, you know, and they should have all... But, it's, but I still had to kind of get over a period of years learn to overcome personal homophobic attitudes, you know, my personal discomfort. I think one of the big and things... that took me a lot, of, a lot of time to outgrow, and that was still something that was in my brain. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of attitudes about sex, sexuality, sexual identity, gender expression, all of these things where I, I, I was just monumentally ignorant and just went with whatever I was told. Yeah. And now that I have a better understanding of it, my, my views have changed. And one, one thing um, that changed and yet didn't change... Uh, I've always had a great deal of respect for the Constitution of the United States. I had, I have much greater respect for it now that I've actually read it and understand it, as opposed to the de facto, uh, this is God's country and we have this wonderful Constitution. The bits and pieces that you're fed as a fundamentalist Christian kid, those all sounded awesome to me, and you're basically, it's drilled into you that the Constitution is is great, and it wasn't until I was much older and had freed myself from religion that I actually properly began to understand the value of the Constitution and appreciate it more, although it's far from perfect. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm not doing the, yo, America, we're the best, we're number one. We're number one in a well, couple of things. Well. Yeah. We're, we're number one in a couple of things. We're number two in a couple of things. We're number 50 in a couple of things. Um, so my, my, my respect for the Constitution is more about what this country can be than what it actually is. Very good, very good. Thank you. All right, thanks. We've hit the 90-minute uh, mark. Yeah. Thanks for calling in, Frank. I, I know that I'm going to be sad in a minute because we're no longer going to be on the air. Oh, but you won't be able to fill yourself with yummy thread gills. Actually, no, actually, no, I won't. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but you can go and, and eat some on my behalf. Thanks to everybody for showing up today and to our studio audience, audience today. the folks in the booth who are making the show better and better every week, trying to so sort much. through audio issues, our wonderful phone system. I feel like I should, ah, uh, because of all the problems that we had trying to get callers in. Uh, this phone system is a, is a massive boon. Yeah. I'll be out next week. I'm sure that Russell will be here along with, I'm not sure who, but it'll be a good show. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.